going to talk about the sub-GV direct detection that we're doing uh, in Crest. And so I think I can go quite fast over these first uh, few slides because, uh, well, it's known stuff that we have evidence for dark matter on all different scales. And the nice thing about in introducing the idea of, of dark matter and energy is that it can explain all of these phenomena on all scales compared to maybe some other ideas that try to explain only one of these. The uh, problem is that we still don't know what it is, which is why we're here. Um, we, don't, we do know quite little, but we don't know, know nothing about dark matter, so we can list a few um, properties of uh, what this dark matter should have, which is the amount uh, that we have in the universe, which we know mainly from the CMB power spectrum. And from here on, I'm going to just assume now we're talking about a particle, right? So for the rest of the talk, I'm talking about dark matter as a particle solution. Um, we know it's stable because it, on a cosmological time scales because it's, it's still here. Um, from structure formation, we know that it should not be hot, so it should be non-relativistic in some sense. Uh, we do know for sure that it interacts uh, via gravity, and if it, what it, it hopefully does interact with some other uh, force with the standard model particles that is not gravitational, but if it does, it must be some force on the, on the weak or sub-weak scale. Uh, the problem is now that uh, none of the particles that we have in our standard model fulfill all of these properties together at once. So a lot of clever people came up with a lot of different ideas. For, so we've seen this plot with a lot of different um, particle candidates spanning over quite a huge range of, of masses and interaction cross-sections. Um, and so to, to try to detect these, in principle, one can divide the detection mechanisms into three main categories, which is the, the production of dark matter at colliders, and then uh, going in the other direction looking for an annihilation signal in, in like telescopes or satellites, and uh, the one that I'm, I'm going to be focusing on now is the direct detection, which is uh, looking at the scattering. So the, the basic idea is basically really just uh, dark matter particle, particle scattering on a, on a nucleus, for example, and then leaving some, nuclear, uh, uh, some, some recall energy in that nucleus. And so the most simple basic picture we can look at is we're looking at some elastic uh, scattering, coherent scattering, and a spin independent case. Um, although like every one of these points can of course then be exchanged with something more complicated. But so that's just the most simple idea. One of the, um, let's say basic ingredients that uh, we need for these direct detection experiments is the, to assume that we live in this uh, dark matter halo that is like just a spherical halo around the, the center of the Milky Way uh, with the standard assumptions that within this halo the dark matter particles are moving in a, in a Maxwellian velocity distribution and some standard values for like solar velocity, escape velocity and so on. And yeah, I know this, this dark matter density is, is kind of outdated. Um, problem here I think is that many experiments still use this number to just be comparable within each other or with all the results, but my personal opinion is it should be updated, but there should be, this is like a community-wide effort to really, that everyone uses the same number and then also probably you have to include it in your old results and so on, so. Yeah. Um, the spectrum that we would uh, expect to see in our detector is uh, described by this recall rate. So here I have some color, oh, this seems a bit shifted. I see the old slide on the top. So in, in color coded, in, in red, I show the stuff that it depends just on this on this halo model. So like the, the local dark matter density, and basically this this whole integral here describing the the velocity distribution. Then in green we get some nuclear physics, and in blue we have the parameters of interest, which is the dark matter mass and the the cross section. And so what I did here is already I I split the cross section into um, these two parts, which is this sigma zero, just a cross-section at zero momentum transfer, which then has to be scaled with this nuclear form factor that becomes important for high recall energies and for heavy uh, targets. Like you see, for example, for oxygen, the effect is quite small even at high recall energies, while for the heavier tungsten it becomes already important at just a few kV. So, so this is something that also, like, for example, xenon it has to take into account for like, these, these heavy nuclei. Um, and then, so the cross-section that we normally show in these, in these limit plots is then the, is the material-independent dark matter nucleus cross-section normalized to one nucleon, this one here. 
So this is nice because then you can compare your limits in between different experiments and, and especially between different uh, materials that you use uh, in your target. And here we get this, this A square dependence, which basically tells us that uh, heavier nuclei are preferred for higher cross sections. To look at this in a bit more detail, so this is the basic operator uh, uh, cross section that we use for the spin independent uh, measurements where we have these contributions from, from, phone, uh, uh, from proton and neutron to the total coupling strength, strength, but there typically we assume them to be of the same size and then we get this A square here in this term. And uh, then depending on which material you use, for example in Crest we have some materials that also give us sensitivity on the spin dependent uh, cross section. So as I said before, we have this basic picture but then the whole, the, the recoil rate is quite modular so you can just exchange things like for example we can look for, for spin dependent um, interactions as well. Then, uh, so this is what, the, uh, for example, on, on the calcium tank state, which what we are using in Crest, what this um, recoil rate would look like. And here you see really the, the effect, especially in the tungsten, of this, of this um, nuclear form factor. Looking at the range of masses, it becomes pretty clear that if you go to sub GeV dark matter, for example, here in blue is the line for a 200 uh, MeV in the pink for a 500 MeV dark matter particle, you run into some experimental challenges, which is you're dealing with very low energies. So the endpoint of the spectrum, for example, for a 200 MeV particle is already between uh, 30 and 40 EV nuclear recoil energies. So you need a very low energy threshold to be able to see them. Plus, in addition, you're dealing with very uh, rare events. So this is uh, per picobahn, which normally we are orders below that, and then if your energy threshold is, is somewhere around here in the tens of EV, you're really dealing with very um, rare events. So we, we really need to make sure to keep our uh, backgrounds in, in control. So typical backgrounds that we have uh, is like cosmic radiation, of course, then some long-lived uh, natural radio isotopes, um, human-made radioactivity, and two very dangerous uh, backgrounds for us is, is neutrons and neutrinos because they kind of mimic exactly the signal that we would expect from, from a dark matter recoil. <coughs> One thing that pretty much all big uh, dark matter direct detection experiments do for shielding against the cosmic radiation is just going underground. And then uh, in your setup underground you have additional layers of, of shielding and vetoing. Typically, you really take care of, of, of checking the radio purity of the materials that you use. So then this is all on the, on the setup side now. And then, of course, this last point goes more on the analysis side, where um, you can use some event-by-event -event discrimination. So many, many direct detection experiments use several channels to read out. So you can, you can use uh, heat, light, or charge, for example. And by using two of them, you get some kind of a handle on, on discriminating between uh, different, different events. Here's a probably not complete list, I tried to put everything there that I can think of, of, of like efforts that were done in the last decade. So it's really amazing how many experiments actually were looking for this. Unfortunately, nobody saw dark matter yet, but it's, it's really, it's a big amount of experiments looking in all, or in different, in different uh, parameter ranges for, for these direct detection signals. And uh, like, yeah, one of them is, is us here in Crest, in Gran Sasso. So we're, quite small collaboration of about 50 people from eight institutions in four countries. Uh, CREST stands for cryogenic ray event search with superconducting thermometers. We, we, it's a cryogenic experiment. Um, we're located in the underground lab in LNGS in Gran Sasso. So uh, it's about 1,400 meters of rock, which gives us quite a good shielding against uh, muons from cosmic radiation. And then we have inner shielding, which uh, helps us also with the, with the neutrons and the gamma. Um, particles. So, oops, is a picture of the, the halls inside the, inside the mountain and then the, the crest setup. So this is what it looks like from outside. And then inside these containers we have our, our cryostat and all these several, like we have several tons of polyethylene around and then uh, an active muon vehicle system, 24 tons of lead, 10 tons of copper. And then what is not shown in this picture, but actually inside here we have another layer of polyethylene um, which, which helps us against uh, neutrons that might be induced by like, some residual muons coming from cosmic radiation. 
And then, yeah, in the middle here, we have the so-called, uh, what we call the carousel, which holds our detector modules. Um, so this is what, so we use different geometries in Crest, but let's say that's the most standard one, like most of our modules look something like this, where we have, uh, here's our main uh, crystal, which is like two by two by one centimeter in size. And uh, mostly we're using uh, scintillating materials, apart from like silicon, for example, it's not, but, so we're using uh, calcium tungstate, lithium aluminate, sapphire, and, and silicon. And so these crystals are all equipped with this little tungsten transition edge sensor, which, which we get these sensitivities for uh, nuclear re recoil energies of something below 100 EV. And then here, this disk shows uh, our light detector. Did it again. Um, so we, for example, in Crest, we also catch the scintillation light of, of signals, which is like, so this is also equipped with the transition edge sensor. And uh, yeah, these we can just use for, for discrimination between the, the, different, um, the different recall events. So the very basic principle, principle of this color, uh, cryogenic colorimeter is just, if we have a particle interaction in our crystal, it heats up the whole crystal. So there's a signal going up and then it's coupled to a heat bath which brings it back down to its base temperature. So slowly cools back down and then we have a pulse with every interaction. In a little bit more, more detail, so these sensors um, are equipped with, a, there's a little bias current running through these transition edge sensors and they're kept at a temperature of like something between 10 and 30 millivolt, uh, millikelvin, sorry. And they're kept in an operating point pretty much exactly in the transition between the normal conducting and the superconducting state. So now if anything hits the crystal and heats it up by something in the order of, of microkelvin, the, the resistance in this little bias current changes in the order of, of uh, milliohm. And then this is just read out with some squids, amplified, and then that's where we get a signal. So we have first this fast heating up, and then with the, the thermal coupling brings it back down to the, to the base temperature. So this we do for, for both the, the photon collector, this is the main absorber, and our light detector. And then we put them all into a, a light yield plot. The light yield is defined as just um, for each event, the light signal that we see divided by the phonon signal. And this is calibrated in a way that we say that our most dominant background, some radioactive background, is mostly electron recalls. This is just uh, defined as, as a light yield of one. And then in comparison to that, the nuclear recalls that we are, we are looking for are, have a quenched uh, light output. So we can, up to, let's say, a point where they start to overlap, we have a pretty good handle on discriminating these, these events. Um, right now we're in Crest Phase 3, which started in, in 2016. So the first run of Crest 3 was running from May 2016 to uh, February 2018. We're still in Crest 3, so here's a picture of, of uh, two years ago. That's me. That's, so it's a nice thing. I'm doing analysis mostly, but in Crest is quite small, so you get really the chance to see all parts of the experiment, which, which I personally like a lot. So I volunteered to go down to Gran Sasso to mount the new detectors of the, of the current run. And these pictures are from uh, February 2020. Unfortunately, then the pandemic hit, and we had to wait a bit more than six months until we could actually start measuring, which then happened in the fall 2020 and it's currently still running. Uh, to go back again to the first run, just a one slide about, uh, because the, the results I'm showing and most of the plots come from, uh, or what we call detector A, uh, because this one just gave the, the best results and lowest threshold in this first run of Crest. So this was a self-grown crystal. We have a, a group at TU in Munich that grows these crystals themselves, and they have a very high radio purity, better than the ones that you can get, uh, get uh, commercially. It was a roughly 24 gram crystal, and the uh, total exposure of, the, of this measurement campaign was something a bit less than six kilogram days, so really not a lot, but it's tiny crystals. So. <laughs> and yeah, the, so with this detector, we reached a threshold of only 30 EV. And so what, some things that were special about this uh, uh, module was that we, the, the holding sticks that were holding the crystal in place were themselves made of calcium tungstate and were also equipped with uh, transition edge sensors. So we had a, a fully, um, so we could uh, veto kind of look for, for events that were happening in the holding system. And then the second thing was that the whole housing was um, covered in this reflective foil to try to catch as much scintillation light as, as possible. Okay, coming to the, um, the data analysis. So 
since Crest 3, we're using a dead time free DAQ. Before that, we just set some hardware threshold. And whenever a signal came above the threshold, we would just save this record window of the signal. And what we do since, since 2016 is we just record the entire stream of, of data. So for every detector, we keep the entire data because then afterwards we can process them by running an um, optimum filter on them, maximizing the signal to, to noise, and then running a software trigger. And so we define our threshold by accepting a certain amount of noise triggers per kilogram day. So, whoops. Uh, the advantage of filtering is like, it's very obvious. We, can, we are much more sensitive to lower pulses because now we can go lower with the, the threshold without triggering a noise and just gain sensitivity to, to lower energies. And uh, yeah, so after the software trigger, we further process these, these events that, that were above threshold. Just in the next two slides, a few words again, uh, about how this uh, filter works and how we're ex uh, defining our threshold. So this optimum filter is um, defined in frequency space. What we do here is, on the left you see in blue, is the power spectrum of a signal. So we use a mo uh, uh, our signal shape that is very is noise free and then convert it into the frequency space. We do the same with the noise. So in black you have the noise power spectrum. And then basically we just construct this filter kernel by maximizing the signal to noise. So, the, the, so that's what this kernel looks like. The frequencies where the difference is the most just get a higher weight and all the other frequencies get kind of yeah, filtered out. The noise power spectrum is measured? Is the noise power spectrum we take by, by just randomly grabbing uh, parts of the stream, make sure that there's no pulses in them and it's just noise, and then we just average them and, and look for the, for the power spectrum. Um, and then, so uh, we, take, we take chunks of the stream, convert them into frequency space, it's then like the signal here, convolute them with this filter kernel and bring it back to time space, and then that's what it looks like. So we lose, but, so if you look at the filtered pulse, you lose the shape information of the pulse, but the filter is constructed in a way that it um, preserves the pulse side, which is really nice because we can use the output of the filter amplitude directly as, an, as a reconstruction of, uh, uh, of our pulse height. Um, okay, so to the threshold determination, what we do is uh, we take empty baselines from all over the stream. Typically, we also use them for constructing the, the noise power spectrum. And uh, so these baselines, we make sure to, make the, to, to grab uh, a record window that is the typical length of, of a pulse that we save. Um, and then we run our uh, filter over this empty baseline and just save the maximum of this filtered noise. And then, um, under the assumption that this filtered no these, the samples of this filtered noise trace are Gaussian distributed, we have an analytical description of how the maxima of a bunch of these filtered empty bases uh, lines should look like. We throw them all in a histogram, we collect, we collect enough statistics of these empty baselines, run the filter, throw all the maxima in a histogram, and then we can make a fit of our analytical function. And then basically for getting the noise trigger rate, it's, it's quite easy. You scale it to one kilogram day, and then just integrate from energies upwards and check how many noise triggers would you see in one kilogram day for these noise conditions. And in the case of detector A, we, we checked for one, we allowed for one noise trigger per kilogram day, and then we ended up with this 30.1 EV uh, threshold. Okay, so yeah, once we have all these pulses, we, uh, we need to do some, some data cleaning and cuts. And uh, so the, the blinding scheme we have in Crest is uh, more of a semi-blind uh, approach because we're not really blinding any energy range or injecting any fake signals. We really look at the data, but we just choose 20% of this whole stream, the spread over the whole course of the run, define our cuts on these data, and then apply them without any changes to the rest of the data set, and then only use this remaining 80% for any dark matter analysis. <clears throat> so typical cuts, cuts that we have to do is, uh, so one of the first ones is a rate cut, where we just look for unusual high uh, trigger rates, and these are normally connected to some noise conditions, like when a truck passes by, or there's a little earthquake or something somewhere, then these periods we, we throw out. The stability cut is, so coming back to this transition curve, I, I told you we keep it at a stable operating point. So from this point in the transition curve, we can see how high the pulses are, like how much the, the crystal heats up. 
this operating point is not necessarily completely constant in time. It can have some slow drifts in time up or down. And these slow drifts are not a problem. We take these into account in our calibration. I'm going to explain that in a, in a second. What is problematic is if the jump is too high, like outside of a predefined range, or if it happens too fast, because we, we cannot really properly take them into account. So we really check for that and then cut away periods where the detector was unstable, like where the operating point was moving too fast or too far. Then just a bunch of data quality cuts. So we look for uh, just unusual pulse shapes, which is something like pile up or electronic artifacts and stuff, and we kick that all out. And then one of the last cuts we do is we check uh, coincidences with our muon veto or with other detectors, because we don't expect dark matter to hit several times. So uh, we also throw these out. OK, yeah, coming to the calibration. So we are using a, a radioactive source. In the case of detector A, we used a cobalt source with peaks at 60 and 122 kV. In the last two measurement campaigns, we're using um, iron 55 uh, source, which is more up, like it's just better for these low energies because it's at 6 kV. Um, and then, yeah, so as I explained, we, we might have these slow drifts in operating point, and these we take into account by injecting periodically, uh, we call them test pulses. So we have a little heater on the crystal where we inject little pulses with increasing amplitude over time. So, you see like the smallest, and then it just scales up, and then it starts again from the bottom. And this is like regularly injected. And then we look at the reconstructed pulse side, like how high are these pulses in our actual data. And with that, because we know exactly what constant energy we put in, we can kind of track the, the time dependence of the response of our detectors. And they look really stable here. They, they are normally pretty stable, but if you, this, so this is, uh, I think, several weeks of data. If you really zoom in in a closer range, like in a range of hours, you, might, you can see that there might be like slight, slight drifts. So what we do is for every particle event we see, we check at which time it happens, check for the distribution of test pulses, and then correct it with that. So, uh, and then we, we take these corrected amplitudes and calibrate them to the, to the, to the source. And you, you can really see in, in many data how for example, this peak, if it's the, just a purely reconstructed amplitude that you see in the stream, how it's a bit wider, and then after you do this um, correction with the time dependence, they get a little bit more uh, sharp. So this is the first type of calibration, is the energy calibration. There's a second type of calibration that we do, which is the, the neutron calibration. So the neutrons, the, they, they create a lot of nuclear recalls, so we use a neutron source to uh, populate our, our um, nuclear recall bands in this, in this light yield plot. And then we use these data to run a, a band fit. So we use these data to fix the position of our bands, then leave them unchanged, and just put in our actual dark matter data. Here, just a little side note. This was a very nice feature in, in, the, in the first run. We saw these cosmic activation lines uh, at the few kV. So this was pretty helpful to um, to confirm the, 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 the calibration that we did with this much higher energy uh, r radioactive source, or like to do some fine tuning, let's say, in, in the data. So, but then, yeah, once you have this uh, spectrum, we, we define our region of interest, which typically uh, we, we take the mean of the oxygen band down to the lower boundary of the tungsten band. This is just done to reduce as much as possible the overlap with this, um, with this electron recall band. And you see here really how most of the events are actually in the in the recall band, where, which we assume is just background, and just very few events down here get actually uh, accepted. So now we have our measured spectrum and we have our theoretical expectation. The last thing that we have to do before we can actually throw this into a, our analysis is to make sure that we take the experimental response properly into account. Because, of course, we don't expect to see this theoretical recall spectrum that I've shown before. Um, and uh, so this we do by creating these efficiency curves, and this is uh, quite nicely done. We take empty baselines from all over the stream. This time we don't make sure that there's no pulses. We really blindly just, we take, so we take a perfect signal and scale it from zero up to whatever energy we want to look at, and then randomly throw them all over the stream. We just save the amplitude that it had and the timestamp. Uh, then we put this through the entire uh, analysis pipeline and check in the end how many of these survived. And then 
so by this we, we artificially create pileups or we might accidentally throw it on some uh, baseline that has some electronic artifacts so we really kind of simulate everything that we see in the real data. And uh, then you see in light gray, these are all the events that survive the trigger. And then in dark gray, these are the ones that really survive in the very end all of our selection criteria and cuts that we do. And now we can take the, the theoretical spectrum and kind of just convolute it with this efficiency curve and then compare it to our data. And uh, for this, there's, there's two approaches. So you can either do it uh, using a likelihood or classic way, just uh, using a Yellen. The advantage of the likelihood is that in principle it gives the better limits and you can use of any knowledge that you have about your, your background. Plus is the only way of, of having a, a positive signal. So in case you really see a signal, you, you cannot use Yellen, you have to use the likelihood. Big disadvantage is that you need to know exactly what model to use for your background. And that's, at the same time, that's a big advantage of the Yellen is in case you have a background that you don't know, you don't need to care about that because uh, you, you don't need to include any information of, uh, of your background. And it's just more conservative. So normally for the, for the publications we use this. Uh, this advantage at the same time is of course, if you do have some knowledge of, of your background, it's kind of hard to include it or like basically impossible. You can subtract it before, but within the Yellen framework, you cannot uh, include it. A uh, signal, just uh, not, not running a, a limit calculation, but really a contour plot for a positive, ah, for a signal. Okay. Yeah. So in a bit more detail, uh, what we do in the, in, the, in the likelihood framework, we, would, uh, we have a predefined range of, of dark matter masses where we would like to calculate our limit. And then we fix the mass at each point. And for each of these fixed points, we run a best fit of our cross section and our nuisance parameters, which so these include whatever background model we use. And then we fix the, um, the cross-section and run the fit again for the, for the, the background parameters. And uh, then we construct this test statistic, which is like after Wilkes theorem follows a chi-square distribution. So we can use, uh, so we kind of scan through the cross-sections until we find uh, the cross-section where the significance of this test statistics excludes the observed data up to the confidence level that we want to draw a limit for. Um, the way Yellen works, is kind of similar idea. You calculate also for this pre predefined uh, range of masses, you calculate the expected spectrum of your mass and then compare it to your data. And uh, so in this maximum gap method, what you do is you look for the biggest gap between two events and uh, use that for scaling your cross section down to, um, to the fixed cross section that then excludes again the observed data with the confidence level that you, that you want to. What in real so this is the basic idea. In reality, what we use is the, the Yellen optimum interval method, where instead of using an interval with zero events, it checks for an interval with just containing one event or two events or more events, and it does it for several events. And then internally, the algorithm just kind of decides for the optimum interval that gives you the best limit, and then uh, does in, in principle the, does the same way. It looks at the expectation and scales the, the cross section down until the expectation is like significantly. So you would, you would expect to see more than you do and then you can fix your, your limit there. That's what it looks like. So this big fat red line is, is coming from, from Crest. With the 30 EV threshold, we could go down here to about 160 MeV masses. So here above we have the excluded region. And there you see also very nice how the, the big experiments like uh, dark side or Xenon that are very more massive and have a lot of exposure they can push down a lot, while other experiments like, like Sensei, Super City Mass, Crest, they have very small exposures, but they more push for the, for the low threshold to go more to the left um, of this plot. So, uh, yeah, that's exactly how I said. What, what you need to, to push down in this region here that is quite unexplored yet, you need to increase the exposure to go down. You need to lower the threshold to go to the left. There's something else that is uh, limiting Crest a lot right now, um, coming to the, the current state of Crest, which is the low energy excess that many of you might have heard of. So Crest is dealing with this unexpected uh, event rise, so which goes above the expectation of a purely flat background, which for us starts at about 200 uh, EV. And uh, yeah, we have the problem that we still don't know where this is coming from. 
uh, what we can say is that the pulse shape of these events is indistinguishable from particle events, so we kind of exclude that it's kind of uh, any, any electronic artifacts or something. Going in the same direction is uh, we exclude that it's just noise because A, it has a pulse shape, and B, I explained before how we define our threshold. So with a less than six kilogram day exposure, we expect maybe three, four events uh, of, of noise in here. Um, there is no clear scaling with volume or surface, which is among the, like, is one of the arguments that kind of speaks against dark matter. Also that it's incompatible between different detectors. We've seen it in different materials. So apart from the calcium tungsten, we've also seen it in, in the second measurement uh, phase of, of Crest 3 in a sapphire detector. And a very interesting feature is also it seems to be decaying over time. So here we have a detector A from, from the first run. We see that the, this, this excess is really decaying over the course of the run. And then here is a sapphire detector from, from the second measurement campaign showing the, the, same, the same feature. Yeah, so in, 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 in the case of, of this detector, it was just uh, 35 days. Uh, and here we were more in like 80 days, but a similar range, I would say. Sorry, and that's one detector? This is, this is two different detectors. This is uh, detector A, which is a calcium tank state. And this is in this, uh, the following measurement campaign of Crest, a sapphire detector. I mean, there's a bunch of... Uh, so another interesting thing is that here, um, I don't know if you can read it, there's a neutron calibration in between, and it seems like it has no effect. Like after this neutron calibration, it keeps just falling down. Uh, yeah, so to that, there is a bunch of, there's a big variety of ideas uh, related to stress in the crystal lattice, uh, stress coming from the holders, and micro fractions or something inside the crystal impurities. Scintillation light that comes from somewhere in the holding structure that is not caught by the, by the light detector. Low energy alpha events that happen close to the surface, and, and many more. Um, it's unfortunately still open question. But what we, what we are doing right now for disentangling this is we, we run uh, um, measurements with different configurations. So as mentioned before, we use uh, different materials with different hardness, different, just different properties. And then we have also modules that are basically the same, but one we run with the scintillating foil and one without. We use different uh, materials for the holding system, um, Different, different, uh, different ways of holding the detector. So these are all designed. So the current measurement is really dedicated to this low energy excess. All these different detector designs that we use are specifically designed to disentangle uh, some of these ideas or hypotheses that we have about the the excess. And um, so yeah, currently, pretty much right now, there is some the finalization of the analysis is going on. So we're doing some confirmation tests and running some cross checks, so that the next month. Some doing a bit of advertisement here for the Access Workshop, which I think is a really nice thing. It's a common effort of the whole community because not only Crest is seeing something like this, like this low energy excess. There are several experiments that have to deal with that. Um, and so there's this community-wide effort where people meet and like, show the result of both the efforts, show ideas what it could be, and so on. And we're going to have the third edition of this next month, and there I'm, I'm going to present some new results from the current run. Okay, so in the end, just a few... Sorry, just, just before you go on. Sure, sure. The, the, the bound that you showed a few slides ago, the red, the red curve. This one? Yeah, so, so then... I didn't get the sense what these, these low energy events you have. Is this part of this analysis or is this is after this was completed? Uh, so this is basically this spectrum here is used for calculating these limits with the Yellen method, and this gives us this limit. And then you see, really at low energies where this excess becomes really important, yes. we go up by several orders of magnitude. So, if, how do I say this? What would, it, if you were to like draw on your finger, what, if that excess wasn't there? I don't have, I don't. What would, the, what would it be expected now then if, if you're willing to, you know? I don't have the plot in the backup, but I know it. Roughly, yeah, by yeah. so don't don't quote me on this exact number. Right? But we have studies where we show like <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it does it does go down quite a lot. Like we will we will end up somewhere around here. If if you use if we really uh, say we can we can tell what the success is and get rid of it. So this is really limiting at Crest. That's why really the the last and the current measurement campaign is not 
uh, is, is really fully dedicated in finding out what the success is more than producing new dark matter results. This is like the main priority right now. And the turn up is going to be effectively the same place because of the threshold. I mean, this sharp turn up here is basically coming from the fact that at 30 eV, if you look at the 160 MeV particle, the, the endpoint of the spectrum is basically at threshold. So you expect very low number of events. So then your sensitivity just jumps somewhere. <laughs> So, this is, this is uh, using the average spectrum. Okay. So, uh, right, yeah, that you, might, you might think that you can maybe uh, reduce the exposure and just use the second half, where you kind of hide the excess, but, or you include some time dependence in your likelihood. There are ideas and uh, the, what, what you can do about this, but this is done with the average spectrum of the whole run, where you just have the full excess in there. I don't know by heart like where we would end up, but probably you would. I mean, you reduce the exposure, but I, I honestly don't know right now what, how much you would gain. This is a tungsten result? This is, this is calcium tungsten, yeah. Okay. okay, so, right, so the, the plan for Crest is that we upgrade to uh, 288 readout channels, so we, we're going to end up in, in ton day exposures with this. And uh, so in last year, we finalized the prototyping and testing of the wiring at the squids. And uh, the idea is to end of this year and next year to uh, install all of this at our setup at LNGS. At the same time, last year and this year, we're doing uh, a lot of uh, detector R&D to try to push the thresholds even lower. But at the same time, of course, we want to try to maintain a high production rate because yeah, if we scale up the channels, we, we need a lot, of, a lot of detectors. So this is something we need to take care of as well. And then, yeah, plan is also to, to prototype and test them this year and then put them into, into the setup in Gran Sasso and then start uh, data taking with this um, next year. And then, yeah, we're hopefully going to push in this interesting regime and uh, let's see what we're going to find there. Find out the access, uh, maybe dark matter, who knows. Uh, and at some point, uh, with high enough exposures, we might even touch the neutrino floor at some point. Thank you. <laughs>